People often like to believe that everything happens to them for a reason. In suffering, for instance, you're given what you can handle. For those of faith, God is supposed to have a plan. Four years ago, Kate Bowler became a mother for the very first time. She was also a divinity school historian, and she had just finished writing a book. Then came the phone call from her doctor, who told her she had incurable stage four cancer. This, of course, turned her life upside down, including her relationship with God. Her memoir, Everything Happens for a Reason and Other Lies I've Loved, examines how to handle everyday life when nothing makes sense anymore and how to cope when you lose faith. And she sat down with our Michelle Martin to talk all about it and to tell her story. Kate Bowler, thank you so much for joining us. I'm so glad to be here. So let's back up for people who aren't uh, familiar with your story. You are um, married to your childhood sweetheart. You bought your first home after a long struggle with um, infertility. You have your beautiful son. Yeah. You are publishing your first book, which is a groundbreaking a study of prosperity gospel. And then you're having these pains and you're going to doctor after doctor and you're like, what are these pains all about? And then yeah. you get that phone call that you know is gonna change everything. Do you mind talking about that? Yeah, I, I mean, I really thought I finally had it all together. I had finally gotten to that place after so much deferment, like school and, you know, there's just a lot of in your 20s paying into this life you think you'll have. And then I finally had it for about six months and then I just, yeah, I had these random pains. There's no history of cancer in my family. So it just never occurred to me. And I'm a pretty articulate, I think, narrator of my own experience. And so when I was begging people to take me seriously in the hospital, I, I just couldn't believe that it was as bad as it was. So when they called and said that I had stage four colon cancer, it was like a bomb went off. I, I couldn't even put thoughts together. And I certainly couldn't imagine what life would mean after that. Mm. So there's so much to talk about here um, because you're a professor at Divinity School, at Duke yeah. Divinity School, and you've spent your career thinking about the divine, right? Thinking yeah. about the gospel and what it means and what does it mean in the present moment. Yeah. So how did that strike you, given that the eternal is your daily work? Yeah. I mean, it did feel pretty ironic to have spent about 10 years studying religious explanations for suffering, and then to be struck with such a terrible situation that people started explaining me. <laughs> it was, I honestly had never had that experience of being a problem to be solved, that when people met me, all they wanted to do was explain why it was me, not them. And that was hard because I kind of thought, I mean, in a divinity school or any other more compassionate, I hoped for context that people would have more resources to say, to just say, I'm so sorry this happened. But instead, I mean, people reached into their theological back pocket for all kinds of things. <laughs> and some of it was the more, um, like, let's dig into your spiritual past and see what you might have done. It's a, it's a punishment for what sin? Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. an indictment. Um, and that's, that's a lot of what I, because I mean, my first reflex was just to try to process it through my theological background and say, honestly, right now I'm really struggling to know how to explain what feels unexplainable. And honestly, I can't believe that people keep trying to explain me as I'm suffering. And so I wrote this in a piece for the New York Times, mostly forgetting that like a lot of people read it <laughs> and then like not taking my email off the response thing and then getting thousands of people's immediate response which I thought I'd said hey can everybody simmer down for a second on explaining other people's pain and then everyone's response was clearly you haven't considered that you might have um, had sin in your past life God is obviously using this to test you God is closing a door but there's definitely a window somewhere that's opening for you um, and then just the, I think, and this falls on women mostly, the endless performance of cheerfulness and gratitude. So all I was really supposed to say was, I'm so blessed. I'm sure the doctors and God, et cetera, will work it out. I just, this, the scripts around being sick are so thick that people didn't leave me a lot of room for ambiguity. So is that why you wrote this book? It's called Everything Happens for a Reason and Other Lies I've Loved. That's the part that struck me. I wanna I kinda unpack that. So everything happens for a reason. I, that, that's like the main yeah. 
That's the main. Everyone vibe. wants to give that to me. Yeah. And tell me, and why is that for people who are not um, yeah. as familiar with this? Because because there are people who yeah. will think, well, that's ridiculous. The universe is random and cruel. Yeah. And who doesn't know that? And what? You, and for a lot of people, that's just absurd. You're saying that that is an unacceptable answer for a lot of people. Yeah. So, I mean, and there's a range of people who will give you that answer. Among the Christian, there's a very large group that I had studied in that first book I wrote who called the prosperity gospel. The prosperity gospel has a very rarefied view of what faith is. If I, well, you're a seminary grad, so if I said, like, what is faith? Like, what would, you'd probably say, like, hope or trust or something. And their answer is that faith is a spiritual power that every believer is given, and that if they think positively and speak positively, you unleash those forces that bring things into being. And so they look for that in wealth and in their body, so in health and wealth, to figure out if their faith is working. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, any, any you know, setback is a setup. There's a lot of those. Um, there's only lessons. This is life is a kind of obstacle course, and if you do it with cheerfulness and joy, that, that God will always work it out for you. And then there's even sort of less overtly religious versions, um, like all my adorable hippie friends who are immediately concerned that I had not eaten a kale or had not sufficiently taken my essential oils. Oh, you ate too me. much sugar. There's a it was lot that of... Rice Krispie <laughs> treat. That's right. It was the blame game. And I think part of it is, and not trying to be trite, but when someone experiences, when they're close to someone who's suffering, it's really tempting to start doing that inventory. Like, well, wasn't it in your family? Or, um, you know, I, I wonder what kind of environmental reasons we can think of. So that they're always wondering, why you, not me? But the result is, is quite cruel because it expects that, um, that I'm supposed to learn from this lesson and somehow accept that this was supposed to be my pain, my suffering, my fate. And all I wanted was to just want to reach back through that plexiglass that went up the second I got sick and say, like, one second ago I was just like you. And this, this blew my life apart. And I wish I could go back to, to that kind of naive optimism. Mm. Why do you call it other lies I've loved? <laughs> I guess, honestly, I wrote the book because I was trying to be honest with myself. Because as much as I'm saying, you know, it was other people, it was, it was me, too. I mean, I, I wanted to figure out, you know, if I, maybe I could have just worked harder. Maybe I could have done something differently. I just, I was trying to do kind of archaeology. Like, what is it in there that makes me believe that I, that life was supposed to work out for me. Mm -hmm. And so I tried to use it as a kind of reckoning for the, I think, individualism that I was always obsessed with. I mean, I think I, I might not have said I believe in the meritocracy. I'm, I like to think I'm sophisticated enough not to have said it, but I certainly performed it. Mm -hmm. I thought I was special. Mm -hmm. How do you understand it religiously? It's hard. I mean, in part because um, cancer makes you feel like nothing. Really? And just being in the why, hospital. Why I mean, I don't know if it's just that you have to wear a lot of rough cotton, <laughs> but like you go into the hospital and you see a lot of death. And you have this feeling like, like you're at the edge of the cliff and you're being dangled over. Mm -hmm. And it makes you feel like paper. And so everything in my you know, Christian background says, like, you are loved. God loves you so much. Like, you are made with joy and with purpose, you know. But then the experience of being so near death and other people who are dying is you just kind of wonder what was so special about you in the first place. And so I think it's just hard to, um, it's hard to, like, reassert that sense of belonging and purpose. Especially, too, being that sick, you go out into the world and everybody's, like, has a job and has a Starbucks order and... <laughs> And you just don't remember what you were doing anymore or why you were doing it. Is there any part of you that feels angry? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, I was less angry for myself. I was really angry when I looked at my son and my husband. And I thought, this is, this is a very poor substitute for the life that I promised you. You know, to my husband when I married him, to my son when I expected that I was always going to be his mom. And so that was the part that made me the most 
mm -hmm. angry. Mm -hmm. And then some of the other anger just came from wanting so much to feel close to people again and then just feeling so, so lonely. What is it that makes people want to say, everything happens for a reason? <laughs> I think you just have to name it and claim it. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, you know, God doesn't give you more than you can handle. More. Yes, totally. That's a classic. But what, what is it that makes people want to say that? Is that about yeah. them yeah. or what, what, do you, what do you think? I think partly it's, it's that people don't want to surrender that part of our lives that I think we all have that just wants to make meaning even out of the worst moments. And I think that's a beautiful hope. The problem is, is it's really oppressive when you just dump that on somebody who maybe for reasons of illness or, you know, random tragedy or institutional evil uh, puts them on the losing side of life. And so I, I think also people are trying to help people who are suffering to get back to that place of agency where you want to stand up again and fight. And that's so important for anybody who's trying to manage their tragedy. But um, it also totally lets them off the hook because mm -hmm. surely the universe has given you all the resources you need to handle this. Did you grow up in a family that had a faith commitment? Yeah, super Mennonite. So, so did your illness shake them? Did it shake their faith? You know, in one way it didn't because they're so communal in their mindset, it was, it was wonderful to know that they never made me feel like I was going to be alone in this. They're wonderful at communal suffering. Like as a faith tradition, they get it. Life doesn't always come together. Um, but I think like everybody else, they were always just looking for that way that we could climb out of the pit. And there just wasn't one. There's always been suffering. I mean, there's always been suffering. And it's, yeah. you know, many of our sacred texts speak to that fundamental fact. Yeah. So that leads me to wonder, do you still believe that there is a loving God? Yeah. Yeah. I do. I mean, honestly, in the hospital, I don't want for this to sound terribly pious, like just because I'm from a divinity school, I say these kinds of things, but I'm a historian. We We're very uncomfortable talking about our <laughs> spiritual feelings. Uh, but I, I was blown away by the fact that the closer I felt to death, the more I felt intensely loved. And not just by other people, but just a supreme and beautiful peace. I'm kind of just hoping that that's sort of what God does when we're preparing for death, is we get this sense of calm. But um, the more I went on living, the louder life became, and then the more it was easy to forget. And then you go back into the world and everybody's on Instagram and people want their bikini bodies. And <laughs> you're just really excited to be living. Or the guy in the short lane at the checkout actually has 16 items, not 15. That's right. I, I do remember my first feelings of pettiness after the hospital and I just sort of hoped that they would go away, but no, I was as petty as before. <laughs> well, let me just read something from the book. You say that control is a drug and we're all hooked whether or not we believe in the prosperity gospel's assurance that we can master the future with our words and attitudes. And you write, I can barely admit to myself that I have almost no choice but to surrender, but neither can those around me. I can hear it in my sister-in-law's voice as she tells me to keep fighting. I can see it in my academic friends who do what researchers do and Google the hell out of my problems. When did the symptoms start? They ask, is this hereditary? Buried in all their concern is the unspoken question. Do I have any control and yeah. what answer have you come up with? It's so hard because um, I used to use faith as a language of certainty and giving that up has been tough work. I guess, um, I mean, I just pictured my life as one in, that I could control. I would have a long career with a neo-Gothic tower and many PhD students. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, you just have these dreams of what 80 years is supposed to do. And, um, and I never imagined that I would have a horizon in which I can't be certain. It's hard too just with parenting because everything about a kid is, is the language of the future, right? It's the growth chart against the, you know, the door sill. It's what's next year and should he be in soccer? And 
you know, you just want to speak that language with such certainty because it's all the stuff that is under our control. And giving that up has been really painful. Like it's, it's mostly sucked <laughs> because um, sometimes I feel like the future is, is just a language I can't speak like other people. Well, can I ask though, and apologies if it's too personal, how are you preparing? I mean, we, the, the reality of it is, and it sounds so terrible, but it is true that we're all going to leave here at some point. Yeah. But, but you're right, that's not something that, you know, most of us spend time thinking about, yeah. you know. How, yeah. how are you well, it's, I, preparing, I, or do you try not to? Do you try to live as you put it in ordinary time? Yeah. What, what are you doing? Because it's a both, I mean, the problem is, is I think maybe just in the, in the course of the day, in the week, in the year, we're all running the math on what we're supposed to do. Like every, every decision requires a lot of um, just decisions about an investment. Do I really, like how do we spend our time? And I struggled a lot with that, in part because I was, am in a career where while I was in the hospital, I had to decide if I was gonna write a book to keep a job that I didn't know I'd live to keep. And so I had to decide almost immediately, do I act like I'm gonna live or do I act like I'm gonna die? And I want to be able to live solely in the present, but I also sort of have a job to do. <laughs> so I struggled a lot with that. Um, and then I decided that I have to choose the parts of myself that, that fully express whatever gifts I have to give. And in this case, it, I happen to be a historian, as boring as it is. So I decided part of managing cancer would be that I would work really hard and write a new book, and that I would section off a huge part of my day just to be with my kid and the people I love, and that I would have to just keep putting one foot in front of the other. But I mean, I struggled a lot with whether or not, I mean, I think we all do. It's like, is this worth my time? Is this worth my life? You express quite a lot of doubt yeah. in this book. I mean, it's, your book is hilarious. Don't get me wrong. It's hilarious, um, but it's, it's yeah. filled with doubt that the certainties that so many people cling to yeah. are not that. And some people will not appreciate that. And I wonder what that's like for you in a world that teaches the divine, yeah. right? Yeah. Can, well, I'm hopeful. Can you yeah. still do your sure. job? It's, I guess that's, I mean, it's such a fun question because like, if, are we supposed to be experts in certainties if we're people of faith? And I really hope not. I mean, I, I like to imagine that my students at the Divinity School who are mostly going to be pastors or nonprofit workers or casserole bringers of all kinds, <laughs> I, my hope is that since they're the front lines, other than doctors of the places where people go when they're in pain, that they will be the, the thing that holds space for people to struggle. And we need other people. I mean, that was a massive lesson to me the second I was in the hospital. I don't have family here in the States. I only have my university, really. And I, I've just been so, I mean, so needy. I, my, my church and my community uh, fed my family for over a year. I mean, we just need everyone to fill in all the gaps. And so part of letting go of certainty has led me to a real humility, I hope, that says that I'm actually not the right person to say that everything's gonna turn out. But I hope that my experience points to the fact that kindness and love is always the way forward. Mm -hmm. Because pain creates this horrible gap that everyone wants to explain. But all that does to me is say that everybody else needs to step in with the kind of kindness that, that, that puts people's lives back together. And my stuff is mostly irreparable, but I really could use a casserole. <laughs> Kind do you like? <laughs> I'll tolerate tuna. Me? I'll do. I'll do, I'll do whatever. Me. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thanks so much for talking to us. I'm so glad. I to have be every with good you. wish for you, <laughs> Thank you and your family. Thank you. And that you get a really good casserole. I'll take it. <laughs>